Hello, everyone. Sorry, it's a bit, a bit uh, loud here. Um, welcome back to this uh, fascinating conference. And really, Hamid, you've, you've, uh, you're offering us such a, a rich diet of wonderful talks. This morning was just fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and so now we're going to move on to uh, the next session, session two, uh, which is called Referencing the Past, Artist's Position as Subject of History. And we, we have a really rich session with two absolutely wonderful scholars um, here. And our geography is North Africa. And our speakers uh, will talk about art, literature, and activism, and the spaces and connections um, between them. We're going to start with uh, Dries uh, Xikes. Uh, he's a fiction and non-fiction writer, playwright, and scholar. Um, he's a professor of methodology and creative writing, and the director of uh, HAM, the Hautes-Études de, de Management, c'est ça? Um, and he's one of the founders of uh, the Reflexive Group on Decoloniality in North Africa. His main interest as a scholar um, are media, culture, um, various ways of mediation between arts, academia, public sphere. Um, you can read more about him in the, in the booklet, but I wanted just to highlight his uh, recent, fairly recent book, but I gather there's another one on its way now, um, Le Métier uh, de, de l'Intellectuel, Dialogue avec 15 Penseurs du Maroc. Um, for which he won the Prix Grand Atlas, uh, Morocco's most prestigious prize in 2015. Um, so uh, our other speaker, uh, Siobhan Chilton, is Professor of French Studies uh, and Visual Arts in the French Department at the University of Bristol. And she's published on art and the Arab uprisings, cultural encounters in photography, video, graffiti, graphic novels, um, and, and, and so on. And uh, she's the author of a book that I've just started reading, which is really fascinating, Art and the Arab Spring, Aesthetics of Revolution and Resistance in Tunisia and Beyond. Um, so Dries is interested in knowledge creation. Uh, in his work, he seeks to address the missing links between visual arts, literature, and social sciences. And for this, he's chosen to frame his discussion through the prism of um, the Moroccan visual artist Hassan Darsi and the Egyptian writer um, Iman Mersal. Um, Siobhan uh, is going to take us to Tunisia to the context of what in the West was called the Arab Spring, but which Tunisians themselves call the, the Dignity Revolution, Thawrat al Karama, um, Karama, and uh, demonstrating through the work of one artist known as Uma, um, both. Uh, that revolution of 2011 was not a closed chapter, but how through graffiti and in particular social media, uh, she engages in particular debates concerning women. So they will each speak for half an hour and then there'll be a, an opportunity for them to maybe discuss things between themselves and also with, uh, with all of you. So please uh, start to save up your, your questions. Um, so we're going to start with you, Dries. Let me first thank very warmly our hosts at SOAS and British Academy, and highly greet Hamid Khan for making all this happen. Thank you. Today, I'll be talking on three levels, epistemological, empirical, and practical. Where do we stand today? Where do we stand today? In terms of war and war crimes, and this is exactly the times we are undergoing, we tend to have limited memories. When preparing this talk, two remembered facts struck me. The first one from my reading of Isaiah Berlin, who considered two types of writers and intellectuals, hedgehogs who stay in place and dig deep for truth, knowledge, and learnings, and foxes who would go swiftly from one point to another to discover various realms. 
one of the rare figures he considered endowed with both capacities of in-depth research and insightful redirections is the Russian author Leo Tolstoy. While this exception struck me then, it wasn't as clear in my mind until I met the French historian and author Daniel Rivet, who did extensive and brilliant works on history of Morocco, that when under USSR, he was teaching Russian history at the university, having access to limited archives, he used Tolstoy's novels as one of the main sources to draw main findings and insights. The second one is a recent discovery. When confronted to the historical reality of settling colonialism in Palestine, scholars working in Birzeit University at the West Bank in collaboration with various communities encouraged the launching of a platform collecting what they call common archives. They did so through posters and drawings from the end of the 19th century until now to produce alternative narratives and understanding of the past, thanks to artworks, which would allow them to write differently an obliterated history biased by mainstream narratives. You may have noticed that in both cases, the common line is that arts and fiction are considered as alternative informants of past realities when there is lack, biases, or scarcity of sources. My main question today is this. What, the, what is the epistemological status of art and li literary producers? And in what sense, in contexts where, in contexts like ours, Southern Mediterranean, where history is underdocumented and largely biased by authoritarianism and dominant narratives, artists and writers are not only filling the gaps, but also initiating new paths to knowledge. So this is my main issue. Let's recognize that the fact of widening the scope of history and, anthro uh, and anthropology to consider subjective works of art as potential sources of knowledge is in itself a step forward from positivist traditions that discard oral, visual, literary, and artistic materials as invalid support in the name of scientificity or established standards of disciplines. This fight for recognizing the valid place of arts in social sciences has been at various stages for the last decades, each time justified by some leading and mostly marginal scholars. The sum of their interventions have led to a series of epistemological turns, be they linguistic, narrative, emotional, or decolonial. I don't need to go into details. I leave it to you, for you to read. If we follow the track of these turns, we realize that they allowed, in a crescendo way, more and more distanciation from rigid scientific doctrines that casted away literary and artistic words as whimsical, too subjective, and phantasmagorical. In the meantime, they allowed social scientists and historians, from a transdisciplinary point of view, but also in a new conscience of complexity, to shift in the acceptance of non-orthodox sources to renew their respective fields of sociology, anthropology, and history. The notion of turn in itself has been so far a subtle way to think about paradigm transformations, not as ruptures, but as redirections. But what makes each time a turn necessary is a crisis of thought. And the new conscious of scientific limits as a way of categorizing, classifying, and rationalizing social phenomena, and mainly sometimes not considering the psychological individual aspects behind, and also critical move that unveils it preconceived ideologies. Each discipline had preconceived ideologies, and it comes to a limit, and then there is a turn. Turns have demonstrated each time 
the necessity to widen the scope, to understand societies and their power relations, whether through language, texts, forms, or images. There have been different reasons for these terms. The first one has been to consider that any knowledge production is above all a discursive construct and not a statement of truth, which helped critical historians, for example, reconsider established hierarchies between official, institutional, stamped administrative archives and oral testimonies, interpersonal letters, fairy tales, cinema production and art productions in general as symbolic traces and as such milestones of an era. Second, in the ongoing battle to get rid of Eurocentric conceptions of the universal as a normative reference, there have been efforts to rediscover, unveil, reread with new eyes a plurality of realms that constitute various locations of the universal with no center, which involved more scrutiny on singularities as scattered dots that need to be tied together. And these singularities are most of the time uh, held by artists and not only by scholars. Third, knowledge in itself has been rethought thanks to various inter interdisciplinary interactions as not only a given good, but as a constructed link. Non pas seulement un bien, mais un lien. I say it in French because there is a pun in French. Seen as such, knowledge is not a predetermined expertise, but an open pathway to grasp undetermined realities. It is no more represented as an objective or objectified thing that could be isolated in a lab, but also sometimes as an intersubjective, interrelational bond constantly in progress. But can we, can we go a step further? Can we consider art, literature, and cultural symbols not only as subsidiary, parallel, alternative, adjunct sources of knowledge informing social scientists, but as forms of knowledge in themselves? This is, this is the main question. What does this entail in terms of redefining knowledge, but also arts as not only informant products instrumentalized by scientists, but all as active epistemological agents in themselves. I would like to do so while considering very briefly three concepts that could help us in this endeavor. The first one is social imaginary, drawing from works of the Greek philosopher Cornelius Kostoriadis and the Canadian more contemporary theorist Charles Taylor and others, the multiple modernities, and this is, uh, this is a notion coined by Charles Taylor, uh, the multiple modernities we live in, depending on our locations, can not only be understood through visible realities, but also through sedimented, sedimented representations produced by symbolic works and largely shared in public space. And this is that crystallize and create some sort of social imaginary. This lot that can only be revealed through reading, sharing, and appropriation of artistic, uh, mediation and appropriation of artistic imaginary fictional traces is undervalued by social scientists and taken mostly as an extra layer while it is underlying many documented realities. We talk of it in parallel, extra, not as a, an underlying, uh, as underlying documented realities. The second concept is narrative identities, framed by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur that has been largely re revised by critical historians to consider that identities are not fixed, but all the time reframed that all histories are at the end of the day narr narrations and as such constructs where the sensitivity of an artist telling the story through his own grammar and forms, but also the testimony of a victim relating memory from his own angle is not less relevant than a supposedly histori a scientific historiographer. 
And the last notion borrowed from the Algerian philosopher Silwas Lustbulbina is that decolonizing knowledge about our societies leads us to distance ourselves from scientific models produced to colonize them, not only take them for granted as frames of thinking or describing realities, and look rather more closely at literary and artistic artifacts as what she called labs of thoughts. Labs of thought. That's her expression talking about artwork. This means understanding through the uncommon, the unexpected, that stems from critical visual artists, writers, poets, and other creators, seeds of, work, of a cultivated knowledge, seeds of a cultivated knowledge, not an imported knowledge, but a cultivated knowledge that we generally oversee or discard. In fact, as puts it and the Italian playwright Lina Prosa, I quote her, artists, writers, and poets are not rare flowers in an, on an arid field, but underestimated cultivators of speech. Through these three lenses, I'm echoing a whole critical theory that suggests to go beyond binary oppositions between the documented and the imagined, the real and the fictional, and consider through an indisciplinary approach that knowledge taken down from its prestigious institutional stance needs to go beyond disciplinary silos and methodological dogmas to encompass complexity. And that, that, and that opening up to other narratives and forms produced by arts could help more easily remember, re-articulate forgotten, abandoned, and unthought of, of traces that teach us more about more about our under-analyzed societies. Taking all this into account, but also thinking in dialogue with these concepts, I will now look at two well-acknowledged experiences. The first one of a poet and writer from Egypt, Iman Marcel, and the second one of a visual artist from Morocco, Hassan Darsi. I choose these two artists and here I talk about a poet and writer as an artist. Above all, because through their quest experiences, working methods, and positionalities, they embody what I like calling artist researchers. Chercheur artist, artist chercheur. And in that sense, help us think about them as producers of knowledge through art. I will consider Iman Marcel's last documentary fictional work Inayat Zayat, translated from Arabic, Fi Athar Inayat Zayat. The author recalls, recollects all the pieces she can after having discovered a posthumous novel on love written by an unknown female author, Inayat Zayat, in 1966, before finally committing suicide. While it looks like an inquiry into the personal life of the author, the, the death author protagonist, the book is a multifaceted investigation into the recent history of Egyptian society, elites, particularly in Cairo. While uncovering narratives and representations about male gaze, patriarchy, feminism, through the close circle of men of letters in the aftermath of the revolution of the 50s, and dismantling of bourgeois families. It also reveals the status of a new emancipated women, their place in the art circles, in urban configurations and class battles. And because the author tells the story in the making, it questions the status of memory as a personal remembrance and the validity of archives as a support that helps question and not necessarily answer subjective existential interrogations. All in all, it gives us another narrative, more complex, more sensitive, with flavors and feelings that are not, in this case, produced by historians and sociologists. It even invites us through a re-questioning of personal, institutional, and random archives to understand differently the various layers of a city, Cairo. 
And in that sense, Marcel's work could be made in dialogue with some visual artists. Let me here talk about a Jordanian artist and architect, Sabah Innab, who lives in Beirut, and suggests through a personal reappropriation of abandoned, destroyed, but also rebuilt headquarters, layers of history, uh, a creative remapping, a creative remapping of space that reveals forgotten, unknown, weakly analyzed configurations. In a, high, in a slightly similar way, the Moroccan visual artist Bushra Khalidi produced with illegal migrants from various places of the Mediterranean Sea, the invisible maps of their trajectories. Remapping the world through unrecognized or marginalized narratives is, by the way, more and more considered by anthropologists in their attempt to assume agency and subjectivity of actors. But artists who have proved to be daring and creative in this respect by creating personal mappings are paving the way for different perspective. What is common to both creative works, uh, uh, Sabah Innabs and uh, Bushra Khalidis, and sheds light on Imam Marcel's literary process, is how much they involve communities, relatives, families, neighbors, as co-producers of archive. Uh, gatekeepers uh, also, but also as co-interpreters of memories. I'm saying it again. They are at the same time co-producers of archive, but also co-interpreters of memories. And in that sense, art here stems from a stasis that is more a horizontal way of considering beauty and has to be differentiated from aesthetica that looks from above giving prevalence to refined classes on the appreciation of beauty. In that sense, aesthesis has to be understood as a permanent sensitivity of one's ecological realm, producing alternative knowledge with others, with commons, through art as a vehicle, and not on them as objects of arts, but rather with them as subjects of their own history. But as Marsal itself told me in a recent interview, I quote her, knowledge has to be ripped off its prestigious status and reduced to mean intellectual and sensitive understanding. Instead of being overwhelmed by what supposed objective science weighs on our shoulders, she is inviting us to a modest, infinite quest for understanding layers of memory, of truths, and illusions. The work of Iman Marsal is actually an invitation to reconsider, to consider each reading, field trip, informal visit, questioning of traces as an archival act. This means that archives, while generally conceived of as institutional and as such mystified, kept inert, inert or, and mute, are completely reshaped by creative thinkers I'm saying here creative thinkers, who take them as amplifiers of personal memories and sometimes counterpoints to common beliefs. Through the investigative approach that recalls whodunits or thrillers, Iman Marcel's invites us to unfold layers of untold histories. This helps me make a smooth transition to talk about Hassan Darsi's art experiences. Having more than 30 years of artistic practice, this man is considered rightly as one of the few unclassified and not necessarily bankable artists in Moroccan contemporary art. I mean bankable in the international uh, marketplace. Let me recall, but at the same time recognized after, after many years of endeavor. Let me recall two main experiences of his. The first one at the end of the 90s is a series of pictures, is a series of pictures he takes randomly of families, bands, and other curious minds under a tent in a musam, which is the name of, for a traditional festival taking place in a village. Besides the fact that his improvised studio 
helps people feel pride to be taken in picture, what, which happened then so rarely in their lives. It tells untold stories of rare images of persons, figures, characters in Moroccan popular culture. This work tells us an untold story of colors, garments, attitudes, and gazes, and they're represented in books of history, mostly centered on monarchs and elite members and weakly focused on ordinary people. Besides the debate on figurative art in a culture overdetermined by signs and geometric symbols, it's also a contribution to another debate still opposing within academic circles, in Morocco at least, high and low culture, urban space and peasantry, in a country rapidly urbanized during the last 50 years, but also dichotomies between learned and popular culture. The other example I would like to take here is that of Perm uh, Hermit uh, Hermitage Park, which is the matrix of subsequent maquette projects by Darcy. Back at the beginning of the two, uh, uh, beginning of the 21st century, Darcy is finding Darcy finding out that his, this park, midway, midway between a popular neighborhood, El Fida and Darb Sultan, and higher class residential one, Polo, in Casablanca, was abandoned by city governors and became a shabby space for drug consumers and neglected homeless people, and hence a dangerous space that youngsters and women could not even cross safely. He decides then, with the help of urban planners, architects, geographers, to produce a maquette of the space to display, share, in order, hopefully, to have it saved. What a critic calls, in his case, a political practice of art that is not in itself political has been a leitmotif that he used again years later in the case of the square in front. Each time he goes through a long process of understanding the topos the selected space, the dynamics around, the politics surrounding it, and then engages in a technical process that resembles the work of a topographer or a geologist, taking measurements, documenting the seen and unseen object in place, and producing with a bunch of assistants a work of art that is not only supposed to be exhibited, but also to trigger debates, support resistance, but also allow for negotiations. This is exactly what he did more recently in Ben Sliman, a few kilometers away from Casablanca. While extra extractivist powerful companies were planning to launch an, the excavation of a new gravel quarry that was about to destroy an unknown vivid ecosystem, he triggered the creation of a local collective to fight against the project. With ebbs and flows of negotiations and rounds of resistance, the collective produced, under his inspiration, an unprecedented archive of local species, plants, seeds, soils, and collective collectives of inhabitants, which allowed to produce a new ecological set of data and as gathered and reframed arts of work. While trying to explain the process of his work that is made under the banner of La Source du Lyon, and in complexity with his spouse and art curator, Florence Renault, the artist talks like a free scholar about the paradox. He uses the word paradox as being the, at the heart of his concern. Let me quote him while translating his words. The paradox dwell, dwells insidiously in our lives, resides in our social ties, our environment, our thoughts, our acts, it is the opposite of ready-made and preconceived ideas, but also logical certainties. While working on public sphere, public power relations, capitalism, and the commons as a new vehicle of collective intelligence, and creating each time a language that questions their presupposed logics, Darcy tends to create through art new links spaces of debate and articulation. And in that sense, creation becomes a process of understanding, relating to the world, and in a certain sense, rethinking predetermined norms, laws, 
ways of doing that could be taken as institutional knowledge. Ma'rifa, which means knowledge in Arabic, has the same origin as norm, urf. What I have been trying to tell you today is that in the Arab world, taken as a generic expression that doesn't embrace its plurality, there are voices, experiences, that are sometimes more vanguard than scholars in raising crucial questions about our everyday concerns. The Algerian artist Qadr Atiya is one of those who try to find a new grammar to decolonize art and help reshuffle categories of thoughts about dominant discourse on ex-colonies, migrants, geopolitical battles, and frontiers of surveillance. This conference has been a modest attempt from my part, this is my conclusion, to rethink epistemic categories. I try to understand with you how artists and writers could sometimes, when inhabited by a quest, when interrogating existing models, when driven by their conscience, and not only by standard aesthetic canons, become producers of another type of knowledge, this knowledge is subjective, not normative, sometimes simultaneously empirical and intellectual, well anchored in localized realities, but constantly fed by utopias and intuitions. But it teaches us through unpredicted lenses, forms and frames about tensions, crucial issues not covered by research existing agendas, and shows indisciplined ways of looking at our societies and current world. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying thank you very much um, to, to Hamid and to the organisers of the conference. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, the programme looks fantastic, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing the rest of it. Um, the project that I'm working on focuses on 20th century art and activism, and particularly feminist evocations of women in North and, more recently, I've become interested in, in um, representations from West African countries as well. In North African contexts, local and transnational feminisms have been undergoing transformations since the revolutions and protests in the region, which began in December 2010. So how does art resonate with and contribute to these transformations? How does it present women in ways that give us a greater, perhaps more nuanced understanding of the changes undergone by women's rights in theory and in practice? How does it draw on but also invent new alternative forms of visual activism? So see, these are the, the main questions for my project and I'll, I'll come back to the term feminism in a moment. I'm particularly interested in art that moves beyond the icons and iconoclasm which tended to be produced during the revolutions and protests in the Mina Swana region. These revolutions, like other revolutions in diverse modern historical contexts, were often articulated within and beyond the country concerned in black and white terms of success or failure, liberation or constraints, for or against, friend or enemy. 
So the complex range of perspectives in Tunisia, for example, was, and still is at times, reduced to binary perceptions of secularism and Islamism. Iconic images in the media encouraged such reductive perceptions. They tended to imply that the revolution was a closed chapter. They conveyed a people as ideologically unified in their vision of their country's future. And some made what might be taken um, as neocolonial comparisons between this revolution and the French Revolution of 1789 or that of 1830. But art exploring Tunisia in the aftermath of Ben Ali's deposition has frequently moved beyond icons. At the same time, many works don't conform to conventional definitions of visual activism as ephemeral participatory projects. Such artwork, I want to argue, often innovatively forges a way between these extremes to reveal alternative narratives. It conveys that the revolution is ongoing. In relation to Tunisian women, this art signals the continuing need to change perceptions of Tunisian women and highlights their contribution to the country's history, art and identity, past, present and future. So in this paper, I'm going to focus um, on the work of Sfax-based graffiti artist Umama Borasida, alias Uma, O-U-M-A, I'm particularly interested in the ways um, that she presents her work on social media and I'd like to suggest that photographs and videos of the artist within or alongside her murals within the parameters of Instagram or Facebook actually enhance her mission to change perceptions of Tunisian women and of Muslim women in and beyond Tunisia. So Umema began to practice graffiti in 2011 after the revolution. Although she was encouraged by her family, uh, which is not always the case with um, other urban artists, she relates how people are often surprised to see a woman, particularly a hijabi woman, practicing graffiti. So she aims to change perceptions. She says, through my art, I defend today the Arab, Muslim, artist, veiled and free woman, which is what I am, in fact. So for her, there's no contradiction between veiling and being an artist. She sees it as her role to fight against such stereotypes. Umema's graffiti and her presentation of her work and herself on social media resonates with debates regarding the impacts of the uprisings on women's rights in Tunisia and neighbouring countries. It also contributes to rethinking the art, history and identity of Tunisia and what its revolution means for women going forward. So scholars have an analysed the impact of the uprisings on women's rights in Tunisia and North Africa more widely. Uh, Mudira Charad, for example, has commented on Tunisia's relatively advanced state of women's rights, which have actually been guaranteed by law since independence in 1956. Though Charad and Ha have argued that, as they say, sustained reforms were possible because succeeding regimes found it in their best interests to pursue a reformist policy. So she's thinking there clearly about the 1950s um, under Bourguiba, um, but also later under Ben Ali. Also, the rulers, as they state, used women's rights, known as uh, state feminism, as a cover for the lack of true democracy in the country. This state feminism was also used, as Nabila Hamza argues, to silence and repress the independent women's and feminist movement. So critics believe that this is still the case today. Um, so as uh, Gelali of um, Human Rights Watch um, has stated, you know, by championing women's rights while at the same time expanding impunity for acts of corruption, the Tunisian government, um, at the time of writing, 2017, um, is reminding us of how these two contrasted realities worked in the past. Despite women's participation in the revolutionary protests that led to Ben Ali's deposition, feminist organisations have had to continue to fight for gender equality in its aftermath. These scholars agree that the new constitution adopted by Tunisia on January 27, 2014, includes strong protection for uh, women's rights. They refer especially to Article 46... Um, the state commits to protect women's established rights and works to strengthen and develop those rights, and it guarantees equality of opportunities between women and men to have access to all levels of responsibility and in all domains. Yet these scholars show how, despite these measures, 
and more, the more recent reforms that have taken place since that was written, there are still inequalities and there is still the need to implement the forms already pra um, passed in practice. The art I'm analysing tends not to engage directly with these debates, but it nonetheless contributes to feminist activism. It calls to mind, to some extent, uh, Fatima Sadiqi's analysis of a shift since the revolutions and protests of 2010 onwards in North African feminisms, and particularly her observation of their reconciliation with the ancient past, their forging of transversal alliances, and the coexistence of a range of positionings between and including secularism and Islamism. Um, and I should say as well that so while certain artists self-identify as feminist, many don't, or at least don't in the mil militant and activist sense. Um, and of course, I don't think that art by uh, women can be defined or separated from that of, of men. Yet, as Sadiqi states of her informants, their topics and the nature of their strategies are feminist in the sense that they both address that they both address women-related issues and use strategies that promote them as women, e.g. art in the public space. In relation to diverse works of art, I'd add that they converge in crossing spaces and art forms that have traditionally been gendered. As a framework for understanding the emerging female feminist voices in North Africa, Sadiqi suggests the concept of the center, which she defines as a shifting ideological space that began to develop in North Africa in the aftermath of the uprisings. This new space, she says, encompasses and transcends the secularist and Islamist ideologies and may be seen as a space of diversity for interaction between diverse actors, uh, Amazigh activists, radical secularists, radical Islamists, secular feminists, Islamic feminists, and so on. The art I'm examining resonates to some extent with this idea, but this art evokes more ambiguous dialogues with diverse spaces, times, and perspectives, as well as alliances that extend beyond North Africa and beyond communities of women. It shows how art can contribute in a specific way to spectators' consciousness of ongoing resistance in contexts such as that of Tunisia. Sadiqi actually mentions Umema as an example of the more recent feminist voices and strategies which have emerged in North Africa since the various uprisings of 2011, particularly the use of graffiti to reclaim public space and transmit messages to challenge passers-by. But I'd like to show in this paper that we might also say that Umema calls to mind this very idea of the centre through her very presence and visibility as a hijabi graffiti artist. Through embodiment and performance, this artist negates attempts to separate secularism and Islam. And Islam. Also, Umema's photographs and videos of herself with her work on social media develop an aesthetic that extends this idea of a shifting space of plurality and diversity. And it does so by including multiple voices, as well as crossing forms, formats, spaces and cultures. So I'll show you a few more ex examples of her work now. Umema addresses a wide range of, of topics, and she doesn't only represent women, but her, her murals on walls in urban and rural sites in Tunisia and in France have often portrayed Tunisian women, particularly in the years um, just after the, the revolution. Through these portraits, she highlights Tunisian women's diversity, their strength, and their active contributions to society. But the artist's presentation of her work and herself on social media can be seen to enhance and develop her interventions by highlighting her own agency and her presence in and reclamation of public space, not only physical, but also vi uh, virtual and metaphorical spaces. Umema conveys women's diversity by emphasizing local particularities and alternative outlooks through flowing hair or distinctive headscarves, so uh, the white uh, sepsari with uh, red stripes, for example, um, or the flowered uh, hindia, or the white haik, for example. She frequently highlights Amazigh identities via symbols on the women's faces, um, as you can see here, um, or the patterns or objects that sometimes accompany her portraits. The women's strength emerges via their frontal poses and direct eye contact. Some images can be taken to convey the suffering that women experience and their strength despite this 
through a divided face showing contrasting sides, one half smiling, um, one expressing pain. Most women painted by Umema are unknown and imagined, representative of a particular community or tendency. But she's also presented icons, um, including the Sfax-based militant feminist Majida Boulila. Um, Boulila fought for the liberation of Tunisian women when Tunisia was a French protectorate. So this mural acts as a reminder of the long history of feminism and political contribution of women in Tunisia. Women's strength and agency emerge alternatively via the painting of a female hand waving the Tunisian flag and holding jasmine, indicative of their more recent participation in the revolutionary demonstrations. Umema's large, uh, brightly coloured images of women, which might appear incongruous on the walls of Sfax's ancient Medina or emerging from the rubble in more remote rural sites, challenge perceptions also through their very presence in an occupation of public space. She makes women visible in a space in which they are traditionally invisible. But the artist's message gains even more strength, I think, when she's shown with her work within social media platforms. So these photographs and videos um, can be seen in a way to extend her work into a new virtual space where it accumulates further layers. Some of her interventions recall iconic images of women participating in key moments of Tunisia's history, but Imema also paints multiple images of ordinary women which online appear together. Also this shift to an online display which holds in tension the live and digital versions of the work moves beyond the iconic to produce a more complex aesthetic that allows for a reinterpretation by artists and spectators of women's place in the history of Tunisia. The experience of graffiti in situ differs, of course, from that of graffiti mediated via photography and video online. In photographs and videos, the embodied, visceral, kinesthetic experience of the work and its environment can't be replicated. But most people will see graffiti interventions in online fora. So the work is often conceived with the online display in mind. Um, you know, by, by some artists particularly. So Umema's aim to challenge stereotypes and her process of recording each stage of the work suggests that her graffiti is designed from the outset to be seen as a performance. Her words and process, which we see online, highlight her identity as a hijabi woman in a career and physical space from which such women have tended to be doubly excluded. They signal the importance for her of her work as presented online, where process and performance are prioritised over the completed mural. Umema's message regarding Tunisian women's diversity is heightened online, first by what might be seen in terms of a reordering of space and time. That is, her images of multiple women appear in close proximity, one after the other on vertical feeds um, of Instagram or Facebook, or simultaneously if um, grid views on Instagram are displaying numerous thumbnail images are selected. In either format, different women and contrasting urban and, urban and rural contexts are juxtaposed. So this undermines the tendency in debates since the revolution to marginalise regions beyond the city and to polarise Islamism and secularism. The impression of women's uh, diversity is enhanced, secondly, within the images by the artist's presentation of herself together with the mural. So some videos... Uh, are filmed uh, spontaneously and in real time, often by the artist, while spray painting with the other hand. Um, but many are filmed uh, and edited by others, so they have quite a professional look and often include features such as high-speed sequences, rapid back and forth movements, um, or the manipulation of the image to coincide with the, the rhythm of um, a soundtrack, usually a hip-hop soundtrack. And... Um, such videos, I'm showing you uh, photographs here, but it's, um, th there are both. Um, those videos, though, frequently capture the sight of the image before focusing on the artist at work. There's a photograph doing so as well. And they often conclude them with um, a close-up of her with her hands covering her face. Fingers parted either side of her eyes before she removes them and walks back to the completed mural to pose beside it. The photographs similarly often show Umema with this personalised gesture. These images of Umema with her portraits of women appear to layer different female identities, bringing together different contexts, ways of dressing and outlooks. 
So these photographs and videos often emphasize contrast, but they also convey connectedness and solidarity. The artist stands with the women she's painted. Her head coverings link her to some of the women she represents, even while her baggy hip-hop clothing covered in paint signals her difference from them. At the same time, this personal style counters attempts to polarize women's identities as traditional or modern, religious or secular. Umema's incorporation of local forms of dress and Amazigh symbols reveals and reveres ways of knowing and sensing that are particular to women and that have been hidden by Western and nationalist frameworks. Yet, like her dress style, her combining of these visual signifiers with graffiti and hip-hop produces a new way of knowing that layers and oscillates between the Tunisian and the transnational. Um, so there are some comparisons perhaps to make there to, to Drissi's work, thinking about art as a, a way of uh, producing knowledge in a different way. So Umema's connected to the female figures she paints also via um, the signature self-masking gesture I showed you, which she, she often performs. This gesture, which functions like a visual tag, um, ironically and playfully conceals and then reveals the artist's face. It calls to mind the fact that graffiti artists traditionally work undercover, but Umema's practice is highly visible, and her visibility in public space is crucial to her message. So this gesture links the artist to the women she frequently paints with their face uh, partially obscured. A few examples there. Or it links her to the many women she represents solely by a large, um, by large eyes uh, in the rubble, which I showed you earlier. Her gesture ironically links the two sides of her identity as Muslim and graffiti artist. So certain images um, evoke a more complex process of layering. In all the images superimposing a portrait of a woman and the artist herself, women are both represented and representing. Yet in some photographs and videos, the object of the artist's gaze becomes the subject. The images portraying the Tunisian actress, uh, Samia Orezman here, um, are at times accompanied by the actress or her comments on the portrait. Orezman also takes, the, takes on the role of filmmaker. She produced a video in which she interviews Umema in front of one of her murals in the Medina of Sfax, uh, reversing their roles. This mural shows an owl wearing an elaborate Amazigh necklace and carrying on its back a red high-top converse. Umema explains in the video that the owl is the bird that flies and doesn't make a noise with its wings. And that's how it all, always achieves its goals, translating her there. Well, the, the converse, um, on the other hand, represents youth for her. So together, these symbols convey the message that, as she says, you can realize your dreams and goals if you work without sound. The image echoes Umema's own journey as an artist. Watching the video, this connection between the artist and the sort of feminized owl um, might be made as viewers by the viewers as the artist's discussion of this symbolism immediately follows that um, of her comments on her career where she, she was saying that, that uh, following the revolution she could fail and therefore she could study, become an artist and travel to paint murals abroad. The connection between Umema and the owl also emerges visually. Um, so in the video she wears a bright blue top uh, which matches the dominant colour in this mural. The Amazigh design on her T-shirt can be linked with the jewellery in the image, um, and although her footwear isn't visible um, on that occasion, she can often be seen wearing converse in other videos. So Umema's uh, signature gesture of covering her face in other images um, is reminiscent of the owl, which is a recurrent motif across Umema's graffiti and other designs. The, the artist perceives the owl as representing in these times a moment of transition or important change, which viewers might relate to, the Tunisian, to Tunisian women in a post-2011 context more widely. In this video, therefore, three layers and female figures, the filmmaker, the artist, and the feminized owl coexist. Tunisian women's diversity, yet also interconnectedness, is evoked by this superimposition of figures who are simultaneously subject and object, static and mobile, local and transnational. In addition to the layers evoked by the presence of the artist in the image of her work, Umema's use of social media signals the various layers of her own identity. 
This echoes what social media scholars have identified as front and back selves, um, so drawing on the, the work of um, sociologist Irving Goffman. Umema's Instagram and Facebook posts intertwine her multiple professional and personal identities as graffiti artist, fashion designer, teacher, and association leader, as well as daughter, sister, wife, friend, and mother. She also presents an ambivalent identity as a graffiti artist. Her work shifts between art and vandalism, interspersed between the elaborate, sanctioned, often commissioned murals, are photographs of her tags and videos of her tagging, um, you know, and then run, running off very quickly. Uh, so her posts alternate between uh, graffiti interventions and commercial production as well, um, often, often marketing clothing or uh, accessories that she's designed, displaying a motif from her graffiti. So these motifs often cross uh, media and formats. So these shifts are common among graffiti artists today, as Gregory Snyder has noticed. Um, also, while some graffiti artists remain invisible, many do disclose their identities and appear in interviews. But Umema's presentation of herself on social media heightens such ambivalence. Her performances of so-called deviance um, through tagging and also through hashtagging convey her identification and wish to be identified with the original idea of graffiti. She continually undermines this idea, though, not only through her community work, the commercialization of her output, and her visibility in public, but also via her personal posts. So Umema presents aspects of her identity and experience which contrasts with the conventionally masculine image um, of the graffiti artist, you know, understood in a sort of traditional sense. In addition to rendering highly visible her identity as a hijabi woman, some online posts show the artist as a bride-to-be or later convey her experience of pregnancy and early motherhood. Also diverging from the still common tendency to erase the artist's body from the end product, Umema exposes the impact of her art on her body, for example, commenting on the allergies from which she suffers as a result of using spray paint, and you can see her using this um, protective mask, or simply commenting on her tiredness at the end of a busy day. She also reveals her emotions, including quite negative feelings, um, as we can see in posts such as that regarding her difficult experience of the lockdown. So by exposing multiple and shifting front and back selves, Uma Umema, reappropriates this male-dominated form associated with North American hip-hop and reshapes the idea and history of what it means to be a graffiti artist in and beyond Tunisia. The artist's multiplicity, which echoes and contributes to that of the plural Tunisian women she presents across her murals, is reflected formally by her construction from various perspectives, her own and that of others, across media and across media, sorry. So her posts um, include presentations of her in posters, advertising festivals or performances, um, interviews with her in magazines and uh, trailers for films about her. And the videos and photographs she presents frequently show her being filmed or photographed uh, in front of her murals in a kind of mise en abîme. Images of Umema and her images of women then shift between different perspectives, media, and social media platforms, as well as between public and private process and product. They shift between stasis and movement in real time or at high speed. They shift between the spontaneous and the constructed, close-ups and panning shots, image and music. They alternate between grid view and vertical feed or temporary stories, and between linearity, that is sequential development, and circularity, via a looping video or footage that shifts back and forth or via throwbacks. The artist's images of Tunisian women emerge between the artist and the architecture of the platforms she uses, including the algorithms that, algorithms that curate and disrupt the flow of her posts. They're framed by the artist's comments and users' feedback in French, English, Derija and emoticons. So Tunisian women are situated between their physical, local context and this evolving, contingent, virtual, transnational context. So coming to my conclusion, um, art such as that of Umema contributes to reinterpreting history, and particularly that of Tunisian women, in a specific way. 
It doesn't refer directly to debates concerning women's rights in Tunisia since 2011, but it resonates with what feminist scholars and activists have signalled as a disparity between theory and practice by co crossing conventional boundaries between gendered spaces, occupations and art forms. At the same time, it transcends the tendency to polarise secular and Islamic visions of Tunisia and of feminism, which can still be discerned in some activism. As I argued at the outset, Umema's interventions do not only exemplify the transformations of North African feminisms because she communicates messages via graffiti in public spaces. They also resonate with this idea of a shifting plural ideological space. At the same time, they can be seen to extend this. Umema's presentations of her murals and herself bring together diverse Tunisian women, forging translocal connections and at least creating the conditions for transnational alliances between women by accumulating friends and followers internationally. But this art signals further alliances, frequently involving transversal connections between women across, but at times also beyond North Africa. The concerns and questions she articulates on social media can, are related to women within and beyond Tunisia, most often reflecting her aim to defend la femme arabe, musulmane. But they also go beyond this. Her collaborations with male artists signal the potential for so solidarity between women and men in ongoing contexts of resistance. We've also seen how her presentation of her work on social media is transforming the globally male-dominated practice of graffiti. Umema's activism resists attempts to marginalise women in local, regional and wider transnational contexts. So activism through art can extend and even exceed more conventional verbal or visual forms. Complementing but also nuancing conventional activism in the sense of conveying a straightforward ideological message, art can allow for ambivalence and contradiction. It can enable spectators to develop a greater consciousness mediated through their senses as well as their intellect of historical transformations. Umema's interventions exceed icons and iconoclasm but also the ephemeral art with which visual activism is often associated. And this makes sense in a feminist, decolonial, uh, post-dictatorship context in which preserving ancient forms by innovating new forms is crucial. Umema's use of specific forms and formats can be seen to develop a distinctive, um, what we might call transcultural uh, feminist aesthetics. She also um, she allows for hidden ways of knowing and sensing specifically by including traditional forms of dress from distinct places, Amazigh symbols and uh, Darja language, and invents new ones between the local and the transnational. Her aesthetics are not only cross-cultural and multi-layered, but also multi-perspectival, intermedial, contingent and evolving, connecting women's voices and visions, past, present and future. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your really fascinating papers. Um, and I think there is a kind of joining because you're, um, you're talking about um, artist researchers and artist citizens um, as, as well. I think that's, that's one of the threads that came out of both of your, of your um, papers. And, and it's so interesting, um, actually, the whole Tunisian context. context. Some of you here may, may have been to... Um, Tunis when they when they do this amazing thing called Dream City every couple of years, which is very much um, actually exp uh, the use of public space um, and activism and uh, and so on. Um, are there are there questions? Uh, yes, um, Melissa. Not to be well, thank you. Um, pedantic, but just as the. Um, new and somewhat ambivalent owner of a hedgehog as a pet, um, also someone who can't say no to their children, I can tell you that they actually travel nine miles a night. So the idea of Isaiah Berlin that they burrow down is really untrue. They're amazing. They go around <laughs> like like they like these little, little legs, and they're very rapid, and they're nine miles a night. It's amazing. Okay. 
The second question is for you, Siobhan. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the use of Amazigh um, patterns, because I was not just in the uh, work of Umema, but in general, how is that being used? Like, is it a kind of a specific reference to Amazigh, or is it a kind of solidarity with indigeneity, or is it cool in the way that Berber carpets became cool? Um, so could you yeah, talk about, I think, in Tunisia and North Africa more generally, how that's being um, wielded? I think we'll pass on the hedgehog situation, I think, if, if that's all right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Is that okay? Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's. I think they're used in different ways by different artists. But um, in um, Umema's work, um, and in the work of others, I, I think as well, um, that engagement with um, the Amazigh culture through through symbols or sometimes through through techniques. Um, is part of a, I see it as a part of a kind of multi-directional engagement with um, different spaces and times and um, a way to go beyond um, binaries that might perceive the, um, you, know, you know, sort of um, divide things into modern and traditional um, because, uh, you know, she shows us that uh, that's not really that's not happening. You know, the indigenous is something flexible and evolving. And uh, it's interesting then to see that she uses those same designs on the, the fashion that she, um, that she designs herself. She uses those same motifs. So she makes them resolutely contemporary, if you like. I mean, contemporary is another loaded word, of course. But uh, yeah, it's a, a way, I think, of, of going beyond binaries for her. I think there is um, an indication of... Um, the specific, but also um, of solidarity mainly. Yeah. So she hasn't spoken about the specific meanings of the symbols she's using. Um, sometimes she says, you know, this motif is um, actually an object that's used to apply um, uh, uh, mascara or, uh, or coal. Or you know, so um, she sometimes tells us about the use of it. But um, I would say that it's more to do with this kind of multidirectional transcultural engagement and um, also an expression of solidarity and sometimes the idea of um, going beyond the binary as well of the rural and the urban. Um, other questions? Uh, yes. Can we, can, uh, we don't have very long, so okay. if the, no, I'm just going to go to Nada, actually, if so, first, and then to coming to you. So, um, so can, can they just be questions rather than comments, just so we can squeeze in as many as possible? That yes, great. thank you. I'll make it very quick, Venetia. My first question, although the question, unfortunately, the answer may, the question might be short, but the answer might be long. But the first <laughs> question is for Dries. Um, and I, you know, just to say that as, as art historians, we definitely accept the works of art, by artists as forms of knowledge that inform the history that we write. But of course, us historians of non-Western art do encounter another sort of layer of struggle, which is the, the colonized um, canon of art history. Is this something that um, have, you've been considering? I'd like to hear some comments from you about that. And a quick question for um, uh, Shiban is that, is Umayma accepted as by the local art scene as um, you know an equal artist, or you know what kind of relationship does she have with them? And thank you both for your wonderful presentations. Dries. Yeah, th that's a that's a, a real uh, a real point, and uh, actually uh, there is th there is definitely a conversation and a dialogue between uh, artists as. Uh, producers of alternative narratives and alternative ways of doing art in themselves and crafting their art. And, and also the work that of some art historians are considering while decolonizing the gaze of, on art. Um, uh, I like the fact, for example, in, uh, in the work that has been done, for example, on Casablanca, um, Casablanca Art School, uh, for example, uh, at the beginning, many people were just doing comparison doing, uh, with, with Bauhaus. But then when they dig deep uh, in, the, in, the, in the history and then see the relationship with the public sphere and a lot of, a lot of things, and also with, with, uh, with uh, a craftsmanship uh, in, in the background, they realized that, that, that thanks to art historians, they re reconsidered uh, categories. 
but that's, that's, that's for sure a, a very important point. Uh, but that was not my, that's not, not, I'm, I'm not ignoring this. I'm, I'm just uh, considering it. But thank you for asking me because I, I, I think that it's very important to understand this dialogue. I, I, just to give another example uh, of, an, of a, of a, um, of a uh, our director, uh, Ali Safi. Uh, Ali Safi, who has been doing, in a, in a certain way, he's, do, he's revisiting the archives of cinema in, in Morocco by doing himself producing art, but also writing on art. And sometimes uh, some uh, artists and scholars are uh, going beyond the, bron the boundaries and frontiers between both. Uh, and that's what, for example, Ali Safi is doing. So um, it's a very, uh, a very interesting point. Uh, I would say that this is coming only from what, I call, what Michel Foucault calls heterotopia, uh, uh, art historians that are very much interested in alternative spaces and in independent art productions, because not all art historians are looking at this because they are mostly taken uh, within the marketplace of art that is mostly uh, westernized. So can we go to you? Because the, so the question really is, is, uh, is to what extent is Umema accepted in that kind of world of art? And I, if you'll allow me, I, just as a kind of extra question there, to what extent was when she was doing those graffiti, um, is, are, are the people around, how are they reacting to the graffiti? So it's a kind of double question here. Sorry about that. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, yeah, she, she is accepted by the, the local art scene. Um, and we see in a lot of um, footage and photographs her um, collaborations, um, sometimes with other artists, um, including male artists, um, so male and female, um, also not only graffiti, but other um, hip-hop um, forms as well. And um, we can see um, from the display of her work on social media the extent of her participation in um, urban festivals, hip-hop festivals. She's been presented on, um, in uh, two films as well, a short by uh, Malik Burkash and um, another film um, co-directed by Car um, Caroline Pericard and uh, uh, Karen Morales. Um, and, uh, but alongside a dancer and a slam poet, which is quite interesting as well. Yeah, so often it crosses, crosses genres. Um, and how are people reacting? Yeah, I think, I think the issue is often um, precisely with the reactions of, of passers-by mm, more than with you. the rest of the art scene. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I, I mean, she has said that that's become easier, you know, as um, the years have gone on, people are more used to, um, you know, people uh, creating graffiti in public space and... Um, you know, the appearance of, of women artists in that public space as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, in, in one of the films, actually, it shows uh, a scene where um, a, a man stops and says, what are you doing? You know, and she tries to explain to him, but he, he's a bit dismissive. And this is actually caught on camera, which is yeah. interesting to watch. But I've, I think... Yeah, there's, people become used to it. She says it's yeah. easier. Interesting. Can I just get a sense of how many questions there are? So, because uh, Hamid, have we got five, five minutes? So, so one, two. Yeah, I just I, think the. Yeah, two. Can I just oh. take them all before? Sorry. No, I, I'll just take the quest questions before, and then we'll come back to you. Sorry, just to be. Sorry, is it me or not me? No, it is you. Just ask okay. The yeah. Thank you then for I'll, the incredible the other reciprocity between the two. My question is um, to Driss. I've got. Well, I mean, I suppose I just want to say that art historians think that social science is supplementary. All your plea was to do with supplementarity, whereas for us, the uh, other disciplines are blind, literally blind, cannot see the world of cultural heritage and its riches. And I, my question, if you want it in question form, is are you not firstly becoming um, an art historian? And does this not give you a critical uh, relationship to all your peers who's got who have this idea which has beset my own studies in in France to so do with scientificité but not just scientificité but the intellectual repertoire which is a male intellectual repertoire which is necessary to your discipline before that eye opening thank you thank you i think yes let's have the so we'll, you can answer in a second i'll just take that question i think she wants somebody else. yes yes I actually, have we'll take your, me. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed Birmadani. Um, ben Sliman, the project in Ben Sliman. I was there two days ago, and then building a house two kilometers away. I agree with it, it's a, it's a disaster. Anyway, my problem is similar to the question Nadia asked decolonization. I find it very hard. In fact, I have been traveling to Morocco for many years, and Morocco is my, my subject. How can you be decolonized when you keep on talking about colonization culture? Can I just stop you there? Would you yeah. mind? Is that the question? Yeah. So, okay, let's take those, those two, Chris. Oh, I think they're, they're, both of those are huge. <laughs> and, then, and then we'll go to the last question there. Okay. Uh, maybe... Uh, oh, okay. We'll... No, no, I want to... If, would you mind? Just oh, okay. answer those two. All right, okay. We'll, go to um, well may, maybe you can... Uh, I, I'm trying... I'm more, more, more of, most of the time talking to social scientists. And I'm trying... Uh, to uh, speak maybe uh, another language from within to social scientists, while I come from literary from literary uh, literary studies myself. So uh, my concern is that uh, instrumentalization uh, categories that you are talking about all this as, uh, is uh, g uh, giving social sciences a sort of pre uh, prevalence. Uh, on art production as and consider it as marginal, as you say, they've been blind, blind to all this. So, so I, my, my, I'm not talking to art historians because art historians are even myself. They are teaching, uh, helping me understand things. My own concern is with social sciences. So that's my point. Um, and uh, and I'm saying it's in societies like ours. Uh, you know, Morocco uh, sociology and philosophy has been banned for for years, and, and now we are getting into a very, very uh, neo-positivist orientation when it comes to social sciences uh, and mathematization of, of, uh, of knowledge that, uh, and uh, sort of discarding of, of uh, uh, singular, uh, singular trajectories in understanding uh, complexities of society. So um, the, the context from where I'm talking is not the same. So that's why you, you, you see my point. Uh, ben Sliman. Uh, ben Sliman. Um, well, let me tell you, uh, there is a big, uh, a big issue that has been to be re re solved, uh, mainly in a country like mine, Morocco, which thinks that because it was under protectorate, it was not colonized. Uh, uh, and, and thinks that decolonization is a historical question, not a permanent one, because they don't understand that post-colonial elites are themselves reproducing colonial culture, uh, either through capitalistic or ex extractivist uh, or, uh, or ignorant uh, practices. So I, I totally agree with you. And that's why the question of decolonization is a permanent one. But when you go to these places, who is, who is uh, deciding? Deci the decision make is made by the rulers, the local rulers, the, the local uh, qaid, uh, uh, and, and people who are linked to the state, and the main uh, industrial guys who, are, who have the, the money in order to... And all these are reproducing colonial, colonial sometimes monocultural, monocultural, mono... Uh, lithic ways of, of exploiting uh, soil and space, etc. Uh, and decolonizing means also not considering space and uh, ICOS, which is l'ecology, ICOS, the place, as a colony. When you're not considering the place as a colony, then you're considering that there are humans, that there are species, and there is ecosystem. But this is uh, this is a fight, and that's why I was giving the example of Hassan Darsi and the collective as fighting against this. But this is very marginal for the time being, and unfortunately.
So we're just going to take the last question. Sounds like you've got a lot to chat about over lunch. So. Thanks, thanks very much for an excellent uh, panel. I have a question for Dries, um, if it's okay. Um, uh, Dries, can, can you say a few words about the link between the kind of really important questions that you invited us to think about today and your work on the notion of indiscipline? It will take hours. So I know, it's just a few words. A, a, few a, words. Quick, a quick uh, one and then... Yeah, my, 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 last, my last essay is called uh, Les Sentiers de l'Indiscipline. It's been now translated in, into English. Uh, I hope it will come out next year. Um, and um, my own concern in, in my work on indiscipline and indisciplinarity is to consider um, three levels. A discipline as a power in terms of power relation in terms of knowledge production, in terms of art uh, reflection and relationship with public space. And of course, what I've been developing today has to do with the third aspect, while it's intermingled with power relations and, and uh, knowledge production. Um, the, the whole question of indiscipline is going beyond interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity in the question mainly of serendipity, taking the time to error in order to find what we are not looking for. But that's a big question. Or today, research agendas don't allow time for, for research, don't allow uh, uh, for uh, these uh, uh, error, uh, sort of wandering, these wandering methods. Uh, but I'm, I'm, doing, I'm trying to look at this as the, the only way that uh, could be Possible, and I realize that artist researchers are doing, are having, are having interdisciplinary way of doing research, and of course, uh, it's sometimes it's very striking what they can come out with. Thank you. I think we have no more time, but I'd, I'd like you to join me in thanking our two really wonderful speakers who've given us so much to think about today. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, Hamid, I know we're eating into the into the lunch break now. So, what time would you like us back? In one hour. In one hour. But I'd also like to thank you in the audience for your very very interesting questions as well. So, thank you. See you all. Thank you.